Welcome to Over the Garden Fence and another episode of the Mariposa Master Gardener series on how to propagate and care for California native plants. Today we're going to take a look at Ceanothus. This specimen behind me is only one of 50 species of Ceanothus that are native to California, but there's also many, many more subspecies and varieties available out there in different shapes, sizes, heights, foliage, and bloom color. So let's go take a look at some of them and see how to propagate and care for them. Ceanothus is a low-maintenance shrub, small tree, or ground cover in the Ramnaceae, or buckthorn family, native to North America. Of the 50 species, depending on who's counting, 41 are native to California. In California, the plants are collectively called California lilac, although it has no relationship to lilacs. But there are as many individual names as there are individual species, many with descriptive names like buckbrush, squaw carpet, mountain white thorn, hoary leaf, wavy leaf, big pod, and many, many others. Most species are evergreen, however some species adapted to cold weather are deciduous. They have profuse tiny flowers produced in dense clusters, mostly blooming in the early spring in a wide range of colors, from white, greenish white, pale gray, pale blue, dark blue, and indigo. Many species have intensely fragrant blooms. Their leaves vary in size and shape and can appear glossy to wooly, deeply crinkled to fairly smooth, and stems vary from flexible to stiff with some producing sharp thorns. In California, the Ceanothus can be found growing on dry, sunny hillsides from coastal shrublands to open forest clearings from sea level to 9,000 feet in the sunset zones 3 through 9. Ceanothus is an important source of protein to deer and other wildlife, and its leaves and stems also contain high amounts of calcium. The flowers produce food for birds, butterflies, bees, and other native insects. There are many hybrids available to the home gardener, some of which have won awards for their beauty and adaptability. They can be used as a screen, ground cover, or other interesting specimen plant. My very favorite Ceanothus is this variety known as Ray Hartman. I love it because of its profusion of blue flowers and its amazing fragrance. In the spring when it's in bloom, it seems alive with so many different insects buzzing around it. I especially love it because it's so fast growing and easy to propagate. This particular specimen came from a three inch cutting that was propagated about five or six years ago. So you can see how fast it grows. I highly recommend it. Once the Ceanothus drops its flowers, clusters of fruit like this develop. And as the season goes on, the clusters dry out and the mature seed pods burst open, casting the seeds a great distance, making it very difficult to gather the seeds. So an easier way to gather the seeds is to simply bag the fruit long before it dries out. And this will catch the seeds in the bag when they're ready to burst. I like to use these net bags so that the fruit is exposed to its natural environment with the sun and air being able to pass through the netting. Like many California natives, Ceanothus is a fire follower, meaning that the seeds germinate in their natural environment after a fire. Like this large stand of Ceanothus integerimus, or deer brush, which we found in the burn scar of the 2017 Sierra Railroad fire. However, like some natives whose seeds germination is triggered by smoke, Ceanothus germination appears to be triggered by heat. So to soften the seeds, tough outer coating, pour boiling water over the seeds and allow them to sit in the water until the water cools. The potential for germination will be further increased by doing this in the fall and then refrigerating the seeds for three months in order to break the embryo's dormancy by mimicking the typical California winter, but in a more controlled way. Remember that seeds collected from hybrids will not grow true to the parent plant, and even species found in the wild easily cross-pollinate, so it's not likely that you'll get an offspring like the parent plant you collected the seeds from. But it can be fun to see what grows out from these seeds. Plant the seeds in the spring in normal potting mix. Cover the pot with a humidity dome or a plastic wrap and watch closely. Once the seeds germinate, Remove the plastic wrap and place the seedlings in a warm, not hot, sunny location. 
The only way to ensure a plant will grow out the same as the parent plant is to propagate the parent plant using stem cuttings or digging up root shoots, thus producing a clone of the mother plant. Success in getting ceanothus stems to root depend on a number of things, most importantly the species that you're using and the time of year that you're taking the cuttings. So technically speaking, you can take cuttings any time of the year, but cuttings from plants in the early spring when the plant is starting to aggressively push out new growth or in the fall provide the best potential for success. The other thing to consider is the species. So a species that has a very flexible stem like this Yankee Point Ceanothus is going to be much easier to propagate using a stem cutting than something that, like this um, buckbrush which has a very stiff and woody stem. These types of cuttings are very difficult to get to root uh, but there's a special technique that you can use where you're actually using some of the older wood along with the stem cutting itself. So because the older wood has a, a lot more of the cells that uh, are specialized to grow roots that lay dormant in the older wood until you take a cutting and plant it or in nature the older wood touches the soil. So one way to do it is to simply take a mallet cutting. So kind of like a little mallet there and so you have this older wood on the stem cutting itself and you would plant that whole thing. Or you can do something that's called a heel cut so it's a little trickier because you're using a razor blade but you want to cut into the stem the older wood and so you have this heel here with this older wood on it and by doing so you're getting some of those specialized cells that you want to have and you would just trim that up a little bit and there you go you plant that whole thing up to about here Normally stem cuttings are just taken with a simple straight cut like this. And while this is a Yankee Point Ceanothus, this method I'm going to show you works on many, many types of plants. So you want to start with something that's about four to six inches long. And if you can, take your cuttings in the morning when the plant is well hydrated and it's not heat stressed. If it has flowers, you want to remove all of the flowers because you want all the stem's energy to go into producing roots, not into reproduction. You want to use something that has a number of leaves on it because by removing the leaves you're exposing the node. So this little thing right here is called the node and in most plants that's where the roots grow out of because in that node are specialized cells like I mentioned earlier that are capable of producing roots. Some plants grow roots out of their uh, the stem cut itself but that's not as common so I always make sure I have some nodes that'll be going into the rooting medium. So you want to remove a number of the leaves and it's always a little balance. You want to make sure you have enough leaves that the plant can still photosynthesize uh, but not too many leaves because too many leaves will cause the stem to dry out. And remember it doesn't have any roots so you've got to keep it well hydrated both with the rooting medium and the humidity that you're going to put the stem in. So you want to take a cut uh, about a quarter of an inch below the node, a fresh cut except for my shears are a little dull. <laughs> you want to make sure you have sharp shears and then make sure that that node is going to go into this rooting hormone. So lots of plants will root on their own. They don't need rooting ho hormone but lots of them are a lot harder to root so I always use a rooting hormone. Uh, you can just get something simple at your local hardware store or the nursery. It comes in powder form and liquid. It doesn't matter uh, and so you should put your rooting hormone in another container because you don't want to contaminate it and then put the powder back into the original container. So you want to make sure that the node is well covered in the rooting hormone and then I'll talk about the medium in a minute uh, but you want to poke a hole into the medium um, and then make sure that that node is well in the medium. So press it down really hard to make sure there's a good connection and we'll talk about what to do next in a minute. So a little bit about the medium. You can use many different things. For things that are easy to root you could just use soil. Uh, some people use vermiculite. Some people use a combination of uh, soil and sand. I like to use perlite for a couple of reasons. It's inexpensive, it's lightweight and easy to store, but most importantly it holds just the right amount of water. So it drains water off really easily 
but at the same time it wicks up water. And so it's just the perfect amount of moisture to get a stem cutting to go. A few words about containers and sanitation. You can use any kind of container really as long as it has good drainage. You can use clay pots, you can use plastic pots, you can use uh, disposable cups, or just a few suggestions. I like to use the six packs because uh, when I go to remove the cuttings, I would like to keep the roots intact and by just popping up the whole cell, I'm keeping the roots intact instead of digging around and trying to remove the cuttings with intact roots when there's a whole bunch of other cuttings in the same container. I also like them because they fit tightly and well organized in the trays that I use when I'm doing a large volume of cuttings. The other thing to consider, you can reuse these over and over again, but you really need to use good sanitation. So if you're using them over and over again, you should sterilize your containers and your tools, your, your clippers and whatnot, um, with a combination of uh, bleach and water. So one part bleach to nine parts water and just rinse out your containers and your tools uh, before you use them. I like to use these trays because, as I mentioned, it holds a lot of six packs and I do a large volume of cuttings at any one time. Typically I have four to six trays going at once because we're growing plants for our Master Gardener plant sale, so we do a very large volume. I like them also because they perfectly fit these humidity domes and your cuttings need to have really high humidity to start with. And I like these vents because as your plants start to get established, uh, you can reduce the amount of humidity by controlling these vents on the top. If you don't have a lot of cuttings or you don't want to invest in this kind of equipment, you can try just doing something like this. Whatever your container is uh, with its cuttings, uh, you can just use a plain grocery store bag. You want to put some kind of pencils or chopsticks or something in the corners of it to hold the bag away from your cuttings because both in the dome and in the bag, you don't want your cuttings to be touching the sides of the dome or the plastic bag because where the cuttings touch anything besides the planting medium, they'll rot. And once they rot, they're goners. So you just want to take a twisty tie or something and tie it off so that it has a good amount of humidity at least for a week or two. Allow the cuttings to sit for about two weeks in the humidity dome or bag, occasionally adding a bit of water to the tray below, but never more than about a quarter of an inch. Then begin to wean the cuttings from the humidity by removing their cover for 15 to 20 minutes several times a day for a few days, slowly increasing the amount of time out of the dome each time. If the stems begin to wilt, immediately replace the cover. Once the cover is permanently removed, an occasional misting of water is beneficial. It's time to transplant your cuttings once the roots begin to appear out of the drainage holes in the bottom of your container. Transplant into standard potting mix and it's not necessary to remove the perlite from the roots. Place newly potted plants in cool, shady location until they recover from transplant shock. Once mature enough, plant Ceanothus in a permanent location with full sun or in the hottest locations with some afternoon shade in the late fall in order to take advantage of the winter rains which will help establish a deep root system. Like many California native plants, Ceanothus prefers little water. It has a reputation for being short-lived, but its short lifespan is usually the result of receiving too much water. Allow the soil to dry out completely between waterings, and after the first year it needs little or no water. Ceanothus does not appreciate any fertilizer or heavy pruning, although it can be shaped up with tip cuttings and dead wood can be removed. However, cutting into established live old wood will cause the plant to decline. The many species of Ceanothus, with their wide variety of size, leaf form, flower color, and versatility, deserve a special place somewhere in everyone's home garden.